Hello everyone, I am Dr. Mazhar Ali and I welcome you back to an introduction to the Artificial Intelligence course. Now so far in this class we have used AI to solve different problems, giving the AI instructions for how to search for solution or how to satisfy certain constraints to find, a, uh, to find its way from some input point to some output point to solve some uh, sort of problems. Uh, so today we are going to turn to the world of learning, in particular the idea of machine learning which generally refers to the idea where we are uh, not going to give the computer explicit instructions for how to perform a task, but rather we are going to give the computer access to information in the form of data patterns that it can learn from and let the computer try and figure out what those patterns are. A machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly, uh, explicitly programmed. Machine learning focuses on the uh, development of computer programs that can access data and use it to learn for themselves. The process of learning begins with the observation of data such as examples, direct experience or instructions in order to look for patterns in data and make better decisions in the future based on the examples that we provide. The primary aim is to allow the computers to learn automatically without human intervention or assistance and adjust actions accordingly. So according to Wikipedia, the machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. It is seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. Machine learning algorithms build a mathematical model based on sample data known as a training data in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. Uh, machine learning is a very wide field and now it comes in different uh, forms. So today we will explore some of the foundation algorithm and ideas that are behind a lot of uh, the different areas within machine learning. So uh, one of the most popular is the idea of supervised machine learning or just supervised learning. So supervised learning is a particular type of task. It refers to the task where we give the computer access to a data set where the data uh, where the, the data set consists of input to output pairs so what we uh, would like the computer to do is we would like our ai to be able to figure out some functions that maps inputs to outputs so we have a <clears throat> whole bunch of data that generally consists of some kind of input some evidences some information that the computer will have access to. And we would write the computer based on that input information to predict uh, what some output is going to be. And we will give it some data so that the computer can train its model on to begin to understand how it is that this information works and how it is that the inputs and outputs relate to each other. But ultimately, we hope that our computer will be uh, able to figure out some functions that, uh, given those inputs, is able to get those outputs. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different tasks within supervised learning. The one uh, we will focus on and they start with uh, is known as a classification. And classification is the problem where if I give you a whole bunch of inputs, you need to uh, figure out some way to map those inputs into discrete categories, where you can decide that uh, those categories are. And uh, uh, it's the job of the computer to predict what those categories are going to be. Uh, so, look at uh, this slide, there may be an example of the weather where we would like to predict on a given day, is it going to rain on the day or is it going to be cloudy on that day. 
So if we really give the computer all the exact probabilities uh, for you know, uh, if these are the conditions, what the probability of rain? Oftentimes we don't have access to that information, uh, but what we do have access to is a whole bunch of data. So uh, if we wanted to, to be able to predict something like, uh, is it going to rain or uh, is it not going to rain? So we, we would give the uh, computer historical information about days. So when it was rained and days uh, when it uh, was not raining and ask the computer to look for the patterns in the, the data. Um, so uh, what might uh, the data look uh, like? Um, we could structure the data in a table like this. So. Uh, this might be what our table looks like where uh, for any particular day going back. So we have information about like that day. So humidity, that day, so air pressure. And then importantly, uh, we have a label. Something where the human has said that um, on this particular day it was raining or it was not raining. So you could fill in this table with a whole bunch of data. And uh, what makes the, this what we uh, would call a supervised learning exercise is that a human has gone in and labeled each of these data points. Uh, the day was a, a rainy day. Uh, we may say that it's a said that on this day when th these were the values for humidity and pressure. So we may say that day was a rainy day and this day was a not rainy day. And what we would like the computer to be able to do then is to be able to figure out given these inputs and given the humidity and pressure, can the computer predict what level should be associated with uh, that day? Does that day uh, look more like it's going to be day that rains or uh, does it look more like a day when it's not going to rain? So I, dear student, we have to train the computer with the data which tells the computer that either uh, it will rain or not rain. So how computer will learn that? So we have to label. <coughs> we have to make the data separate. The label data, we have to make the separate. One attribute should be of the rainy days and one attribute should be of the uh, not rainy days. And definitely we have to also show the humidity, uh, humidity and pressure, which may be the cause or reason of the rain. So let's come that we may put a little bit more mathematically. Uh, you can think of uh, this as a function that uh, takes two inputs. The inputs being the data points that our computer will have access to things like humidity and pressure. So we could write a function f that takes as input both humidity and pressure. And then the output is going to be uh, what category we could ascribe to this particular input points that label we would associate with that input. So we have seen uh, a couple of examples data points here. Uh, we have given this value for humidity and uh, this value for pressure. We, uh, there are two values. One is for humidity and second is for uh, pressure. So uh, definitely the, uh, on the basis of these values we may predict is it going to rain or um, uh, is it not going to rain and uh, that's the information that we just gathered from the word. We measured on different days that uh, the humidity and pressure were. We observed where or not uh, we saw rain or uh, no rain on the, uh, that particular data and this function if is uh, what we would like to approximate. So um, I think if you want to process such type of the data, you may download the data from internet. Uh, this type of uh, data sets are available on the inter internet. Uh, now the computers and uh, we human don't know exactly how this function f works. So it's probably uh, quite a complex function. So uh, 
But what we are going to do instead of is an attempt to estimate it, we would like to come up with a hypothesis function. Uh, hypothesis function is um, shown here with the H, which is going to try to approximate what F does. So we want to come up with some function H that will also take the same inputs and we will also produce an output, uh, either rain or no rain. And ideally, uh, we would like uh, these two functions to agree on as much as possible. So the goal uh, then of the supervised uh, learning classification task is uh, going to be to figure out what does that uh, function h uh, look like. How can we begin to estimate given all of this information, all of this data, what category or what variable should be assigned to a particular data point. So where can you begin doing this? Uh, well, a reasonable thing to do, especially in this situation, I have two numerical values, is um, I could try to plot this on graph that has two x's and x-axis and the uh, y-axis. And in this case, we are just going to be using two numerical values as input, but uh, uh, these same types of ideas uh, at scale as you add more and more inputs as well. So we will plotting thing in two dimensions, but as uh, uh, we will soon see, you could add more inputs and just imagine things in multiple dimension. Like here, this is a graph, but empty graph. The x-axis is a humidity and the xy axis is a pressure. So while we humans have a trouble conceptualizing anything really beyond uh, three dimensions, uh, at least visually, a computer has no problem with trying to imagine things and many, many more dimensions. Uh, so, that for a computer, each dimension is just some separate number that is just keeping track. So, it wouldn't be unreasonable for a computer to think in 10 dimensions or 100 dimensions to be able to try to solve a uh, Problem. You know, uh, computer is uh, working more speedy and more uh, fast than the humans. Uh, but for now, uh, we have uh, got two inputs. So we will graph things along uh, two axes and x axis, which represents humidity here, and uh, y axis, which represents pressure. So what we might do is uh, say, just uh, let's. Uh, take all of uh, these days that were raining and just try to plot them on this graph and see where they fall on this graph. So here might be all of uh, the rainy days where each rainy day is uh, one of these blue dots uh, that corresponds to a particular value for humidity and a particular uh, value for pressure. And then I might do the same things uh, with the days that were not raining. So I take all the not rainy days, figure out what their values were for each of these two inputs and go ahead and plot them on this graph as well. Oh, so you see here, and I have here plotted, you see here, uh, what I did. I plotted uh, both uh, here, means uh, the blue dots for uh, humidity, means uh, it's uh, the rainy days and the red dots uh, uh, for not rainy days. So blue circles here restrains for rainy days and uh, red circles here restrains for uh, not rainy day. And this then is the input that my computer has access to all of this input. Uh, now, what I would like the computer to be able to do is to train a model such that if I am ever uh, presented with a new input that doesn't have a label associated with it. So something like this white uh, dot here, if you see uh, the white dot here, uh, I would like to predict uh, given those values for each of the two inputs. Should we classify it as a blue dot? Uh, because there is a majority of the blue dots. Uh, 
means if we will uh, classify it uh, billiard then it will be it will be a rainy day or should we classify it as a red dot means not rainy day so if you are just looking at this uh, picture graphically uh trying to say all white uh, this white uh, dot does it look like it belongs to the blue category or does it look like it belongs to the red category so i think most of you would agree uh, that it probably belongs to the blue category why you agree because there is a majority of the blue dots so we will uh, we will look Uh, like it's a uh, close to the other uh, blue dots there therefore we may assume that this white uh, dot may be the blue dot and if it's it's a blue dot then means it shows the rainy days <clears throat> so that's not a, a very formal notion but it's the notion that we will formalize it in just a moment that because it seems to be close to like this blue dot now uh, i converted the dot to the blue dot so this blue dot here uh, like nothing else it's a closer to it then we might say that it should be categorized as a blue and blue shows that it uh, blue shows the rainy days so it should fall into that category of i think that day is going to be a rainy day based on that input so it might not be totally accurate but it's a pretty good guess so nearest neighbor classification uh, you i think you have used the k n n k nearest neighbor so this algorithm is actually a very popular and a common machine learning algorithm and most of the people are uh, going to use this algorithm so this algorithm known as a nearest neighbor classification we commonly call it k n n or k nearest neighbor uh, so it's an algorithm for solving these classification type problems and the nearest neighbor classification it's going to perform this algorithm what it will do is um, given an input uh, it will choose the class of the nearest data point to that input means uh, how many uh, the points are nearest to the category like the uh, blue like the red uh, so this algorithm uh, will analyze the nearest neighbors so by class uh, we just here mean category like in a rain or no rain counterfeit or not counterfeit and um, we choose the category or the class based on the nearest data point Uh, so we given all that uh, data we just looked at uh, is the nearest data point a blue point or a data red point so so depending on the answer to that question we were able to make some sort of judgment we were able to say something like we think it's going to be blue or we think it's going to be red so likewise uh, we could apply this to uh, other data points that uh, we encounter as well so if suddenly this data uh, point comes about we will uh, so it would be nearest data is a red means if we look at the uh, blue point uh, or, uh, or even the white uh, white uh, point you will find that it is nearest by the red points Uh, on the left side and if you find on the right side with the blue so the red circle is uh, nearest by the blue points uh, so so given all the data we just looked at is the nearest data point a blue point or is that a red point and depending on the answer to that question we were able to make some sort of the judgment uh, we were able to say something like uh, we think uh, it's going to be blue or we think it's going to be red uh, so likewise uh, if you look here at the slide we could apply this to other data points uh, that we encounter as well so if suddenly this data point comes about we will uh, 
uh, well it's I, I think nearest data is a, a rate if you look at uh, these two blue points even there those both points are nearest by the blue and if you even uh, look at the white point that is also nearest by the uh, red point uh, so though uh, when you look at a point like this white point over here and uh, uh, you ask the same sort of question uh, that the should when you when you look at a point like this white point over here and uh, but uh, there may be a question should I belong to the category or blue point if you look here, the question maybe arises uh, that uh, should that rate point uh, maybe a uh, category of the blue or even the previous the white uh, point uh, maybe the category of the blue point. That's why I make it the uh, blue because it was nearest by the blue points. Uh, so blue points means the rainy days. Or uh, should it belong to the category of eight points? So, eight points means the not rainy days. So now the nearest neighbor classification would say the way you solve this problem is to look at which point it is the nearest to the point. So you, you look at uh, this nearest uh, point and say it's a rate or it's a not uh, rainy day. If it's a red, then it will show. It shows that it's not a rainy day. And therefore, according to the nearest neighbor classification, I would say uh, that this unwavered point that uh, should also be red means not rainy days. So it should also be classified as a not rainy day. But your uh, <coughs> intuition might think that uh, that's uh, also be classified as a uh, uh, it may be a reasonable judgment to make that the closest thing is uh, not rainy day. So, may is well guess uh, that it's a not rainy day. But it's probably also reasonable to look at the bigger picture of things and to say yes, it's true that the nearest point to it was a, a red point, but it's surrounded by a whole bunch of other blue points. So, looking at the bigger picture, there is a potentially an argument to be made that this point should actually be blue. And with only this data, we actually uh, don't know for sure. We are given some inputs, something we are trying to predict and we don't necessarily know what the output is going to be. So, in this case, uh, which one is a correct is a difficult to say. But oftentimes, considering more than just a single neighbor, considering multiple neighbors can sometimes give us a, a better result. So, K nearest neighbor classification. It's algorithm that given an input chooses the most common class out of the K nearest data points to that uh, input. So, there's a variant on the nearest neighbor a classification algorithm that is known as the k nearest neighbor or KNN classification algorithm. Where k is some parameter, some number uh, that we choose for how many neighbors are going to locate. So, so it depends on the data in our list. Uh, sometimes the experience of data analysis show that the value of k should be here. But if you are using the Python, even you may <coughs> uh, draw out the best value of the k, that which best value would be of the k uh, for your data set. So one nearest neighbor classification is what we saw before, just pick the one nearest neighbor and use the category. But with the k nearest neighbor classification, where k might be 3 or 5, of seven to say look at the three or five or seven closest nearest neighbors closest data points to the point works a little bit differently 
so this algorithm uh, we are given an input choose the most common class out of the k nearest data point to that input so if we look at the five nearest points and three of them say it's a raining and two of them say uh, it's not raining <coughs> what uh, we will go what we will do so definitely we will go with the three instead of the two because the majority uh, is in the three because each one uh, effectively gets one vote towards that they believe the category ought to be and ultimately you choose the category that has the uh, most votes as a consequences of that so k and n gives the decision on the majority of the nearest neighbors or on the nearest points so k nearest neighbor uh, classification fairly straightforward uh, one to understand intuitive uh, de definitely uh, intuitively uh, so you just look at the neighbors and figure out what the answer might be and it turns on this can uh, work very very well for solving a, a whole variety of different types uh, of classification problems but uh, not every model is going to work under every situations and so one of uh, the things we will take a look at today uh, especially in the context of supervised machine learning is that there are a number of different approaches to machine learning a number of different algorithms that we can apply all solving uh, all solving the same type of problem so all solving some kind of the classification problem where we want to take uh, inputs and organizing it into different categories so no one algorithm isn't necessarily always going to be better than some other algorithm they each have their trade offs and maybe uh, depending on the data so one type of the algorithm is going to be better suited to trying to model that information than some other algorithm and so this is uh, what a lot of machine learning research uh, ends up uh, being about that uh, when you are trying to apply machine learning techniques uh, you are often looking not just at uh, one particular algorithm but trying uh, multiple different algorithms trying to see what is going to give you the uh, best results for trying to predict some functions that maps into to outputs so what then are the drawbacks of k nearest neighbor classification uh, there are a couple i think even if you are working on the k nearest neighbor but not only the k nearest neighbor <coughs> all the classifiers have drawbacks when we analyze the data and we are definitely using the different type of the classifiers we found the advantages and disadvantages uh, of the classifiers so we take the that classifier for our data set which have a little number of the drawbacks so it is not matter that only with the k nearest neighbor is the drawbacks but the uh, svm naive bias and several others uh, have also the uh, drawbacks so definitely we will uh, discuss these all type of the uh, algorithms in uh, this lecture to clarify the concept uh, i'm not um, uh, going to do the or focus the single algorithm or uh, make some practices but definitely i am trying to con clear your concepts about the machine learning algorithms that um, if you are uh, using um, or uh, if you use any algorithm for your projects or for other data analysis you may remain uh, you may take easily so one might be that in a naive approach at least it could be fairly slow to have to go through and measure the distance between a point and uh, every single one of uh, these points uh, that exist here now there are uh, ways of trying to get around that there are data structures that can help to make it more quickly to be uh, able to find these neighbors 
so there are also techniques you can use to try and prevent um, some of this data uh, remove some of uh, the data points so that you are only left uh, with the relevant data points just to make it a little bit easier but ultimately what we might like to do is come up with uh, uh, another way of trying to do this classification and one way of trying to do the classification was uh, by looking at uh, what are the neighboring points but uh, another way might be to try to look at all of the data and see if we can come up with some decision boundary so some boundary uh, that will separate the rainy days from the not rainy days and in the case of two dimensions we can do that by drawing a line for example uh, here is a, <coughs> a line that separates the uh, both categories the blue that shows the rainy days and the red that shows the uh, not rainy days so uh, what we might want to try to do is just find some line find some separator uh, that divides the rainy days the blue points over here and from the not rainy days the red points over here we are now trying uh, a different approach in contrast with the nearest neighbor approach which just looked at uh, local data around the input data points uh, that we cared about so now what we are um, doing is trying to use a technique known as a linear regression to find some uh, sort of uh, line that will separate the two holes from each other uh, if you look at the slide so now sometimes it will actually be possible to come up with some line that preferably uh, separates all the rainy days from the not rainy days Realistically, uh, though this is uh, probably cleaner than many data sets will actually be. So, oftentimes uh, data is a messy. There are outliers. Uh, there is a random noise that happens inside of particular systems. And what we would like to do is, is still be able to uh, figure out what a line might look like. So, in practice, the data will not always be linearly separable. A separable uh, where linearly separable refers to some data set where I can draw a line just to separate the two halves of it perfectly. Uh, so instead, uh, you might have a situation like this where, uh, where, where there are some rainy points that are on the side of the line on the definitely the right side of the line and uh, some not raining points that are on the left side of the line and there may be not be a line that perfectly separate what path of the inputs from the other half that perfectly separates all the rainy days from the not rainy days but uh, we can still say that uh, this line does a pretty good job and we will try to formalize a little bit uh, later uh, what we mean uh, when we say something like this line does a pretty good job of trying to make that prediction. But for now, uh, let's just say we are looking for a line that does a, as good of job um, as we can at trying to separate one category of things from another category of things. <coughs> So let, uh, let's now try to formalize uh, this a little bit more mathematically. We want to come up with some sort of functions. So, some way we can define this line. And our inputs are things like uh, humidity and uh, pressure. Uh, in, in this case. So our inputs we might call x1 and x2. x1 is equal to humidity and x2 is equal to pressure. Therefore, we may call it x1 is uh, going to be our uh, humidity and x2 is uh, going to represent pressure. So, these are inputs uh, that we are going to provide to our machine learning algorithm and given those inputs, we would like for 
our model to be able to predict some sort of outputs and we are going to predict that using our hypothesis function this is the hypothesis function uh, which we called h means we show the hypothesis function with uh, h where we are going to show the humidity with the x1 and going to pressure with x2 so our hypothesis function is going to take as input uh, x1 and x2 so humidity and pressure in this case definitely x1 is a uh, humidity and x2 is a pressure so hypothesis is a consisted of hum uh, humidity and pressure and you can imagine if we didn't just have uh, two inputs we have a uh, three or four or uh, five inputs or even more so we could have this hypothesis function take all of uh, these as input <coughs> and uh, we will see examples of that uh, little bit later as well and now uh, the question is uh, what does this hypothesis function do uh, well uh, it really just needs to measure is this data point on one side of the boundary or uh, is it on the other side uh, of the boundary and um, how do we formalize uh, that boundary the boundary is generally going to be a linear combination of these input variables at uh, uh, at least in this particular case so what we are trying to uh, do when we say linear combination is to take each of these inputs and multiply them by some number that uh, we are going to have to figure out so we will generally call that number a weight for how uh, important should uh, these uh, variables be in trying to determine the answer like the these uh, weights <clears throat> okay so uh, weight each of uh, these variables with uh, some weights and uh, we might add like a uh, uh, constant to it just to try and uh, make the function a little bit different and the result uh, we just need uh, to compare is it uh, greater than zero or um, is a little bit dif different or uh, a uh, little bit maybe it will maybe it will be different but uh, is it greater than zero and if it is greater than zero then it means our earning uh, or is it less than zero to say it doesn't belong to one side of the line or the other side of the uh, line and so what that uh, mathematical expression uh, might uh, look like is this uh, one we would take each of my each of uh, variables x1 and x2 uh, you even you may defined with the other variables a1 and uh, b or a or b but i defined here x1 and x2 so multiply them by some weight for example i don't know yet now what that weight is but uh, uh, it's going to be some number weight 1 and weight 2 and um, maybe uh, we just want to add some other weight to zero to it because the function might require us to shift the entire value up or down uh, by a, a certain amount and then we just compare if we do all this math is a greater than or equal to zero if so we might categorize that data point uh, is a rainy Uh, means it, it is a rainy day uh, and otherwise we might say no rain so the key key so the key here then is that uh, this expression is how we are going to calculate whether it's a rainy day or not so we are going to do a bunch of math um, uh, mathematics or math where we take each of the uh, variable multiply them by a, a weight uh, maybe added in an extra weight to it so like the uh, see if the result is greater than or equal to zero and using that result of the expression we are able to determine whether it's a raining or not raining so this expression here is in this case uh, we are able to determine whether it's a raining or not raining so in this case uh, 
going to refer to just some line if you are uh, you were to plot that uh, graphically it would just be some line and what the line actually looks like depends upon these weights x1 and x2 are the inputs but these weights are really what determine the shape of that line the slope of uh, the line and uh, what that line actually looks like so we then would like to figure out uh, what these weights should be so we can choose uh, whatever weights we want but we want to choose weights in such a way that if you, uh, you pass in uh, rainy days uh, humidity or and pressure then you end up with a result that is greater than or equal to zero and we would like it uh, such uh, that if we passed into a hypothesis function a not rainy days so input then the output that we uh, get should be uh, not raining so before we get there let's try and formalize this a uh, little bit more mathematically just to get a uh, sense for how it is that uh, you will often see this if you uh, uh, ever go further into uh, supervised machine learning and explore this idea one thing is uh, that generally for uh, these categories we will uh, sometimes just use the names of the categories like rain and not rain often mathematically uh, we were trying to do comparison between uh, these things so it's uh, easier just to deal in the word of numbers so we could just say 1 and 0 1 for raining and 0 for uh not raining so if even you see here w1 is um, uh, with the x1 and the w2 is x2 so where will be w0 so definitely multiply by 1 so let's see uh, so we do all this math and uh, if the result is a greater than or equal to 0 we will go ahead and say uh our hypothesis and the hypothesis function is uh, definitely gives the output so i uh, i mean uh arranging and otherwise it outputs zero meaning not raining and often times this type of expression will instead express using vector mathematics and all the vectors is uh all the vectors are basically the if you are not familiar with the term is it uh, means if you don't know uh, if what is a vector so the vector basically refers to the sequence of numerical values you could represent that in a python using like a list of numerical values or a couple of uh, with the numerical values <coughs> and here we uh, here uh, we have a couple of sequences of numerical values one of our vectors one of uh, our sequences uh, definitely sequences of the numerical values are all of uh, these individual weights so w0 w1 and w2 means this is a w0 this is a w1 and this is a w2 so we could construct uh, what we will call a weight vector and we will see why this is a uh, useful in a uh, moment called w generally represented using a, a bold face w that is uh, just a sequence um, of these three weights so weight 0 weight 1 and weight 2 this is a weight 0 this is a weight 1 and this is a weight 2 and to be able to calculate based on, uh, on these weights whether we think a day is a raining or not raining uh, we are going to multiply each of those weights by one of our input variables so that w2 this weight is uh, going to be multiplied by input variable x2 if you look here the weight w2 is a multiply by uh, x2 uh, variable x2 and uh, w1 is uh, going to be multiplied by uh, x1 this is a w1 and it is uh, going to be multiplied by x1 and what about zero with the home it would be uh, multiplied so okay don't worry uh, well it's uh, not being uh, multiplied by anything but to make sure the vectors are the same length and we will see why that's uh, useful in just a second we will just go ahead and say w0 is a uh, being multiplied by 1 this one 
because you can multiply by uh, something by one and you end up getting the exact same number so in addition to the weight vector w uh, we will also have an input vector that uh, we will call x that has three values this x it has three values one x1 one, x2 one again because we were just multiplying w0 by one eventually and then x1 uh, by w1 and then x2 by w2 so here then uh, we have uh, represented two distinct ve vectors a vector of uh, weights that we need to somehow learn the goal of our machine learning algorithm is to learn what this weight vector is supported to be so we could uh, choose any arbitrary set of um, uh, numbers and it would produce a function that tries to predict rain or not rain either it's uh, either it's a raining or not raining but uh, it probably would uh, wouldn't be very good what we want to do is uh, come up with a good choice of these uh, weights so that uh, we are able to do the accurate prediction and then uh, this input vector uh, represents a particular input to the function a data point for which we would like to estimate so is that day a rainy day or is that day a not rainy day and that's uh, going to vary just depending on what input is uh, provided to our function so what it is that uh, we are trying to estimate and then to do the uh, calculation so we want to calculate uh, th this expression here and it turns out that expression is what we would call uh, the dot product of uh, these two vectors the dot product of uh, two vectors just means taking each of the term and the vectors and multiplying them together so w0 uh, w0 multiplied by 1 and uh, w1 multiplied by x1 and uh, w2 multiply uh, it uh, by x2 and that's uh, why these vectors need to be the same length and then we just add all of uh, the results together so the dot product of w and x our weight vector and our input vector that's just going to be uh, w0 times 1 or just w0 plus w1 times x1 so multiplying these two terms together plus w2 times and x2 w2 times and x2 uh, multiplying those statements together so we have our weight vector which we need to figure out we need our machine learning algorithm to figure out what the weights should be so we have the input vector representing the data point that we are trying to predict a category for predict a label for and we are able to do that calculation by taking this dot product so which you will often see represented in a vector form but if you haven't seen vector before you can think of it as a identical to just this mathematical expression just doing the um, uh, multiplication adding the results together and then seeing uh, whether the result is a greater than or uh, equal to zero or not this expression here is identical to the expression that we are calculating to see uh, whether or not that answer is a greater than or, or equal to zero in this case and uh, so far uh, that reason you will often see uh, the hypothesis function written is uh, something like this uh, a simpler uh, representation where the hypothesis takes as input some uh, input vector x uh, vector x uh, some humidity and uh, pressure for some day and we want to predict an output like rain or no rain or one or z one or zero 
so if we choose to represent things uh, numerically and the uh, way we do that is uh, by taking the dot product of the weights and our input so if it's a greater than or equal to zero we will go ahead and save the output as a one otherwise the output is going to be zero and this hypothesis uh, we say is a parameterized uh, or the this hypothesis is a parameterized uh, by the weights depending on what weights we choose so we will end up uh, getting uh, different hypotheses so if we will choose the weights uh, randomly we are probably not going to get uh, a very good hypothesis function so we will get uh, one or zero but it's probably not actually uh, accurately going to reflect whether we think a day is uh, going to be rainy or day is uh, going to be not rainy but if we choose the weights right uh, we can often do a pretty good job of trying to estimate whether we think the output of the function should be a one means it's a raining or a zero means not raining <clears throat> so that then are two different approaches to trying to solve this type of classification problem and i'll try to support vector machine here so one is this uh, before the support vector machine we try to define the nearest neighbor type of the approach and where you just take a data uh, point and look at the nearest uh, or the look at the data points that are really nearby to try and estimate what category we uh, think it belongs to and the other approach is the approach of saying all wise uh, let's just try here and use v navigation figure out what these weights should be so adjust the uh, weights in order to figure out uh, what line or what decision boundaries are going to be separate these two categories so it turns out uh, that another uh, popular uh, approach a very popular approach if you just have a uh, data set and you want to start trying to do some learning on it is what we call the support vector machine most we commonly call it svm so we are not uh, going to go too much into the mathematics of uh, support vector machine and even uh, not defining the support vector machine in the detail you go and read there is a lot of material there on the net even in the books that what is the support vector machine but here um, i'll define uh, or describe the functions of uh, uh, of the working process of support vector machine and the idea of the motivation behind the support vector machine uh, is the idea that uh, there are a lot of different lines uh, that we could draw a lot of different decisions boundaries that we could draw to separate two groups because the svm is uh, not bound to only the single line but uh, we may draw multiple lines using the svm <clears throat> so for example i had the red data points over here and the blue data points over uh, these are the red point uh, data points which shows not raining and the blue data points uh, here which shows raining so one possible line uh, i could draw uh, is a line like this uh, here so this line uh, uh, would separate the red points and the <coughs> blue points from each other means it separates the red points from the blue points and blue points from the red points so it does so perfectly definitely it works perfectly and so all the red points are on uh, one side of the line and uh, all the blue points around uh, uh, the other side of the line but this should uh, probably make you a little bit uh, nervous if you come up with a model and the model comes up with a line that looks like this and the reason why is that you worry about so 
Uh, well, it's uh, going to generalize to other data points that are not necessarily uh, in the data set that we have access to. So, for example, if there was a point that fell right uh, here, for example, on the right side of uh, the line, then based on that, um, we might want to guess that it is in fact a red point. Uh, but uh, it falls on the side of the line. So, where instead we would estimate that it's a blue point. So, based on that, so this line is a probably not a great choice just because it is so close to uh, these uh, uh, various data points. We might instead prefer to diagonal line uh, that just goes diagonally um, through the data set as we have seen before. But uh, there too, there's a lot of diagonal lines that we would draw as well. So, for example, this diagonal line uh, here successfully separates all the red points from all of the blue points from the you know, perspective of something like just trying to figure out some set of weights that allows us to predict the correct output. So this line will predict the correct output for this particular set of data uh, every single time. Uh, because the red points are on one side and the blue points are on the other side. Uh, but yet again, you should probably be a little bit nervous because uh, this line is uh, so close to these red points. And even though uh, we are able to correctly predict on the input data if uh, uh, there was a point that fell somewhere in this general area, then our algorithm uh, would say that yes, it's a blue point. So when in a part, uh, actual, uh, actuality, uh, it might belong to the red category instead just because it looks like it's uh, close to the other red points. Uh, what we really want to be able to see given this data, how can you uh, generalize this out as uh, based as uh, possible, it is come up with a line like this that uh, seems like the uh, intuitive line to draw. And the reason why is intuitive is because it uh, seems to be as far apart as uh, possible from the uh, rate. Uh, <coughs> data and the blue data. So that if we generalize a little bit and assume that uh, maybe we have some points that are different from the input but is still slightly further away, uh, we can still say that something on the side probably red. Something on uh, that side probably blue. Uh, but we can make those judgments that way. <coughs> Uh, so, that is uh, what support vector machine are uh, designed to do. They are designed to try and find what uh, we call the maximum margin separator, where the maximum margin separator is just some boundary that maximizes the distance between the groups of points. Rather, uh, then come up with the, some boundary that's uh, very close to one side or the other. So, where in the case before we would uh, wouldn't have cared. As long as we are categorizing uh, uh, the input, uh, that seems all we need to do. So the support vector machine will try and find the maximum margin separator. Some way of trying to uh, maximize that uh, particular distance and it just so by finding uh, what we call the support vector which are the vectors that are closest to the line and trying to maximize the distance between the line and those particular uh, points. So look at this slide. You will find the data into different formats. Uh, the reds are surrounded by the blue and it works uh, that way in two dimensions. So it also works and means uh, it also works the, uh, I mean the uh, maximum boundary, uh, maximum margin separator uh, works in the 
two dimension it also works in higher dimension where we are not looking for some line that separates the two data points but instead uh, looking for what we are uh, generally call a hyperplane hyperplane and um, SVMs are working on basis of hyperplane, means the SVMs are separating the data on basis of hyperplane, some detection boundary, hyperplane is some de decision boundary, basically. And, uh, so, uh, that effect, uh, effectively works uh, and effectively separates one set of data from the other set of data. And this ability of support vector machine to work in higher dimension actually has several other uh, applications as well but one is that it, uh, it helpfully deals with the cases where data may not be linearly separatable like this one. so we talked about linear separability before so this idea that uh, you can take data and just draw a line or uh, some linear combination of the inputs that allow us to perfectly separate the uh, two sets from each other uh, some data sets are not linearly separable and some uh, were even two. So you would not uh, be able to find a good line at all that would try to do that kind of separation. Something like this, for example, where if uh, uh, you imagine here are the red points, these are the red points uh, and uh, the blue points. <coughs> Blue points are surrounded by uh, red points. So, if you try to find a line that divides the red points from the blue point, means that this line uh, separates the red points from the blue points. Uh, so, it's uh, going to be difficult, uh, if not impossible. Uh, that any line you choose. So, if you draw a line here, then you ignored all of these blue points that should be. Uh, blue and not red. So anywhere else uh, you draw a line, there's a, a good going to be a lot of errors, a lot of uh, mistakes, a lot of uh, what will soon call lost to that line that you draw, a lot of uh, points uh, that you are going to categorize incorrectly. So what we want to be uh, able to find better decision boundary that may not be uh, just uh, straight line through this two dimensional space and what support vector machines can do is they uh, can begin to operate in higher dimension and to able to find some other decision boundary like the circle in this case you seen in the previous slide uh, that can separate one of uh, these other decision boundaries even uh, that separate one of uh, these sets of data from the other set of d uh, data a lot better as you seen in the previous slide the red uh, the line uh, the circle line separate the red color uh, data from the blue color per perfectly so oftentimes in data sets where the data is not linearly separatable uh, some support vector machines by working in higher dimensions can figure out a way to solve that kind of problem effectively uh, but the uh, classification is only one of the task means classification is a way or one of the tasks that you might encounter and supervise machine learning because in classification uh, what we are trying to predict is uh, some discrete categories uh, we are trying to predict red or blue rain or not uh, raining or no rain authentic or counterfeit uh, but sometimes um, what we want to predict is a real number value and for that we have a related problem not classification but instead known as a regression so regression is a supervised uh, task of learning a function mapping an input point to a uh, continuous point uh, value well, like at the this slide if you look at uh, the regression uh, or the this uh, happen all the time you uh, might imagine that a company might take uh, this approach if it's uh, trying to figure out for instance what the effect of uh, this advertising is uh, like how do advertising dollars is spent uh, translate into sales for the company uh, 
for example and uh, so they might try to try to predict some function that uh, takes as the input and the amount of money like these functions uh, are here uh, definitely that how much uh, amount is spent on the advertising and here uh, we are just going to use one input but again uh, you should scale this up to uh, many more inputs as uh, as well if you have a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, data you have uh, uh, access to and the goal is to learn to function that given this amount of uh, spending and uh, advertising we are going to get uh, uh, this amount <clears throat> so uh, we are going to get this amount in definitely sales and um, you might judge it based on having access to whole bunch of the data like for every past month here's uh, how much uh, we spent on advertising and here is uh, what sales uh, uh, were and uh, we would like to predict uh, some sort of hypothesis function that again uh, given the amount spent on advertising so can predict in this case some uh, real number some no estimate of uh, uh, how much sales uh, we expect uh, that company to do in this month or in this uh, quarter or whatever unit of time we are choosing to measure things in even uh, if you want to uh, make a model for uh, university admission that what was the admission in 2018 what were admission in 2019 2020 and what will be admission in 2021 what will be admission in 2022 and what will be admission in 2030 so even you may uh, uh, make a model using the regression so that is a very good model to uh, predict the future uh, like here uh, how much amount you are uh, investing on the advertising and how much uh, amount will you earn and so again the approach uh, to solving this uh, type of problem we could try to using a linear regression type approach uh, where, where we take this data and we just plot it so on the x-axis if you look here on the x-axis uh, we have advertising dollars spent and on the y-axis uh, we have a sales and uh, we might we uh, might just want to try and draw a line uh, that does a pretty good job of trying to estimate this relationship between advertising and sales and in this case uh, unlike before we are not trying to separate the data points into discrete uh, categories uh, but instead in this case uh, we are just trying to find a line that uh, approximates uh, uh, this relationship between uh, advertising and uh, sales so that if we want to figure out uh, what the estimated sales are for a particular advertising budget uh, you just look it up in this line uh, here like here for example uh, this is a sale so this is a advertisement and what will be the sale <coughs> so so in this case we are just trying to find a line that uh, uh, approximate with this relationship between advertising and sales so that if we want to figure out what the estimate sales are for particular advertising budget you just look it up uh, in this line figure out uh, for this amount of advertising we will have this amount of sales and uh, just uh, try and uh, make the estimates that way and so you can try and come up with a uh, line <clears throat> again uh, figuring out uh, how to modify the weights using various techniques to try and uh, make it so that uh, uh, this line uh, fits as well as possible so for example this is the uh, advertising so what will be the sales point so definitely how much you will advertise so so sales will increase accordingly so with all of these approaches to trying to solve machine learning style problems dear students the question becomes how do we evaluate these approaches approaches we discussed before uh, 
So how do we evaluate the various hypotheses uh, that we could come up with? Because each of these algorithms will give us some sort of hypothesis. So some function that uh, may have seen to inputs to out outputs and we want to know how uh, uh, we, well does that uh, function work. And you can think of uh, evaluating these hypotheses and uh, trying to get a better hypothesis as kind of like an uh, optimization problem. So in optimization problem, as you recall uh, from before, uh, you are either trying to maximize some uh, objective uh, functions by trying to find a global maximum. Or uh, we were trying to minimize some cost functions by trying to find some global minimum. And in this case of evaluating these uh, hypotheses, one thing we might say is that this cost function, the thing we are trying to minimize, we uh, might be trying to minimize what we would call a loss function. So what a loss function is? <clears throat> it is a function that is going to estimate for us how poorly our function performs. More formally, it's like loss of utility by whenever we predict something wrong. That is a loss of utility, definitely. If we will predict wrong, definitely it would be a loss. So that's going to aid to the output of our uh, loss function. And you can come up with uh, any loss function that you want. So <clears throat> just some uh, mathematical way of estimating given each of these uh, data points given what the actual output is and given what our projected uh, output is our estimate you could calculate some sort of uh, uh, numerical loss for it. <clears throat> uh, but there are a couple of uh, popular, lo popular loss functions that are worth discussing. Just uh, that you have seen them before. When it comes to discrete categories, things like rain or no rain, counterfeit or not counterfeit, uh, one approach is the zero to one loss function. And the way that we uh, work is for each of uh, the data points uh, our loss function takes as input and uh, that the actual output is whether it was actually raining, we are not uh, where well, it's uh, not raining and it takes out prediction into account. So did we predict uh, given this data point that it was raining or it was not raining and uh, um, if the actual value equals the prediction uh, then the zero or one loss function will just say the loss of zero. So uh, there was no loss of utility because we were able to predict correctly. But if uh, we will not uh, predict correctly, definitely then uh, it would be uh, loss. So if the actual value was not the same thing <coughs> as uh, uh, what we predicted, then in that case our loss is a one. So we lost uh, something, means we lost some uh, utility because uh, what we predicted was the output of the function, was not what it actually was. And the goal then in a situation like this would be to come up with some hypothesis that minimizes the total empirical loss, the total amount that uh, we have lost uh, if you add up for all these data points, uh, what the actual output is and uh, what hypothesis would have predicted. So, in this case, for example, we go back to classifying uh, uh, days uh, as a raining or not raining and we come up with this decision boundary. How would we evaluate this decision boundary? How much better is it than drawing the uh, line here or drawing the line there? So we could take each of uh, the input data points and each input data point has a label. So whether it was raining or whether it was not raining. <coughs> so if you remember the blue circle shows show that uh, it's raining and the red circle shows it's not raining. And we could compare it to the prediction. 
whether we predicted it uh, would be waning or not waning and assign it uh, numerical values as a result. So, for example, these points uh, over here, they were all raining points. These, these points are all are uh, raining points. And we predicted, the, means on the basis of these points, we predicted uh, they would be raining because they fall in the bottom side of the line here bottom side on the line so they had a loss of zero if it's a raining and prediction prediction is going to be true the loss would be zero nothing lost from uh, those situations because a prediction came into true and likewise the same is true for some of uh, these points over here where it was uh, not raining and we predicted it would not be of uh, uh, these points over here. So, where it was not raining and we predicted it would not be raining. So therefore, there would also not be any loss. <coughs> so, where, where we predicted that it would not be raining but in actually it's a view. So, means these view points. So, it was uh, raining or likewise here we predicted uh, that it would be raining but in actually it's a red point. So, it was definitely uh, not raining and so as a result we miscategorized these data points that uh, we were trying to train on means um, training what type of the training we are going to give to the system raining or not raining and so as a result we definitely miscategorize and as a result there is some loss here because the prediction is going wrong so one loss here there uh, this is this is a, uh, if it's a raining then it's a one loss and this is a second loss but it is a, if it is a not raining then there are also two losses so, definitely uh, for a total loss of 4, 2 on the raining side and 2 on the uh, not raining side. These are 2 on the raining side and these 2 are uh, not raining side. So, that, that might be how we would uh, estimate or how we would say that this line is uh, better than a line that we uh, goes uh, somewhere else or a line that is uh, uh, further down because this line might minimize the loss. So, uh, there's uh, no way to do better than just uh, these four points of the loss if you are just drawing a, a straight line through a space. So, when you will train the system, train the model, so if there will be the uh, errors in the prediction, you will find the uh, loss and definitely loss when you uh, count the accuracy for example uh, 96 percentage accuracy means the remaining four percentage is a basic loss and the same happens in this case if you are saying it's a raining so it would be the 98 percentage and if you are saying your model is a saying it's a not raining again it would be 98 percentage but combined we uh, it's a raining or not raining you will find four percentage of loss so the zero and one loss function checks did uh, did we get it right did we get it wrong so uh, if we um, got it right uh, the loss is a zero means if the prediction is a true then the loss will be zero M means no loss uh, but um, if we got it wrong then the our loss function for that data point says 1. Uh, 1, for example, if you find here it's a not raining, but uh, the blue point uh, showing it's a raining, so it's a loss, 1. 0 shows the perfect uh, prediction and 1 shows the loss, means the prediction is uh, not true. And we add up all of uh, those losses across all of our data points to get uh, some sort of empirical loss. So, how much uh, we have uh, uh, lost across all of uh, these original data points that our algorithm had access to. If you find here, 1 was 1, 1 and 1, 2, and this one, 3, and this one, the 4. 
so there are other forms of loss as well uh, that work especially uh, <coughs> when we deal with the more uh, real values cases so cases like the mapping between advertising budget and uh, amount that we do in the uh, sales for example because in the uh, in that case you uh, care not just uh, that you get the number of exactly right but uh, you care uh, how close you were to the actual value so if the actual value is uh, you did uh, for example dollar 2800 in sales and uh, you uh, predicted that you would do dollar 2900 in sales so uh, maybe that's a pretty good that's much uh, better than if you had uh, predicted uh, uh, you do so dollar 1000 in the sales for example and so we would like our loss function uh, to be able to take that into amount or uh, that account into account as well so take into account not just uh, whether the uh, actual value in the expected value is exactly the same but also take into account how far apart uh, they were <coughs> so so far that one approach is uh, what we call it uh, l1 uh, l1 loss so l1 loss doesn't just look at uh, whether actual and predicted are equal to each other uh, but we take the absolute value of the actual value minus the predicted value so this is the actual value that what is the actual value and this is the predicted value so actual value minus predicted value actual <coughs> so in other words we just ask uh, how far apart uh, were the actual and predicted values and we sum that up uh, uh, across all of the data points to be able to get whatever answer ultimately is so Uh, so uh, what might uh, this actually look uh, like for our data set and um, if we go back to this representation where we had advertising along the x axis sales along the y axis our line was our prediction uh, our estimate for uh, any given amount of the advertising what we predicted sales was was going to be Uh, and uh, our L1 loss is just how far apart vertically uh, along the sales axis our prediction was from uh, each of the data points. So uh, we could uh, figure out exactly how far apart our prediction was from uh, each of uh, the data points and figure out as a result of that what our loss is overall for this particular hypothesis just by adding up all of um, uh, these various uh, individual losses for each of these data points are like these are the far up uh, these are all far up uh, and our goal then is to try and minimize that loss to try and uh, come up um, with some line that minimizes what the utility loss is by uh, judging how far away our estimated amount of sales is from the uh, actual amount of sales so turns out uh, there are other loss functions as well so one that's quite popular is the l2 we discussed l01 02 uh, l1 and now we are discussing a uh, l2 loss the l2 loss instead of just using the absolute value like how far how far away uh, the actual value is from the predicted value so it uses the square of actual minus predicted so how far apart are the actual and predicted values are here if you look here uh, and uh, it requires that value uh, effectively penalizing much more uh, harshly uh, anything that is a worse prediction 
So you imagine if you have a two data points uh, that you predict as being one value away from their actual value as opposed to one data point that you predict as being two away from its actual value. So the L2 loss function will more <coughs> uh, harshly penalize uh, that one that is actually uh, means uh, the penalize that one that is a uh, uh, two away uh, because uh, it's uh, going to square however much the differences between the actual value and the predicted value. So uh, depending on the situation, you might want to choose a loss function depending on uh, what you, you care about minimizing. If you care about uh, minimizing the error on more outlier cases, then you uh, might want to consider something like this. But if you have got a lot of uh, outliers uh, and uh, you don't necessarily care about modeling them, then maybe an L1 loss function is a preferable. But uh, there are trade-offs here. So that you need to decide based on the particular set of data that what type of the loss function you have to use. But what you do when the risk of uh, with any of these loss functions with uh, uh, anything that we are trying to do is a problem known as overfitting. Uh, the overfitting is a big problem uh, that you can encounter in machine learning, uh, which happens any time a model fits too closely with the data set and as a result fails to generalize. So we would like our model to be able to accurately predict data and inputs and outputs pairs for the data that we have access to. But the reason we wanted to do so is that uh, we want our model to generalize well to data that we haven't seen before. So I would like to take data from the past year of uh, whether it was uh, raining and not raining and use that data to generalize it towards the uh, future. So to say in the future, uh, is it going to be raining or not raining? So or if uh, I have a whole bunch of data on what uh, counterfeit and uh, not counterfeit. So US dollar bills uh, looked right uh, in the past uh, when people have encountered them. So I would uh, like to train a computer to be able to in future. Uh, future. So generalize to other dollar bills that I might see uh, as well. And uh, definitely if um, uh, doing watching a lecture and listening, you must uh, make a note and you should download a data set like this, the raining of other data set and you must uh, <coughs> uh, train a computer uh, to be able to predict in the future or generalize to other uh, things as well. So that uh, you might see as well. Uh, the results. If you will train the model and get the results definitely and follow these um, uh, uh, the instructions which I definitely delivered here and dis discussed here with you, you will get very good results. <coughs> so the problem with the overfitting is that even if you will uh, process the model definitely you will find as well the problem with overfitting is that if you try and uh, tie yourself to closely to the data data set uh, that you are training your model on, you can end up not generalizing very well. <clears throat> so what does uh, this look like? If you look here, what you look? So what does it uh, look like? So we might imagine the uh, rainy day and not rainy day. This is a rainy day and that is the not rainy day. Uh, Example again from here, um, where the blue points indicate rainy days and the red points indicate the uh, not uh, rainy day. And uh, we, we decide that uh, we felt pretty comfortable with the drawing a line like this is the decision boundary if you look here uh, between the rainy days and uh, not rainy days. So that we can pretty comfortably say that points on the side uh, are um, uh, 
the, these points means the points on this side are likely to be rainy days and points on this side uh, more likely to be not rainy days but the empirical loss isn't zero uh, in this particular case because we didn't categorize everything perfectly uh, th there was the, this one outlier uh, uh, this one day that it wasn't raining, uh, if you hear, this is the outlier, this show that it is not raining today. But uh, yet our model is still, uh, still predicts that uh, it is uh, raining, but a majority of the points uh, here uh, predict that it's uh, raining. But that doesn't necessarily uh, mean our model is a bit. Because the majority of the points showing that it's uh, raining, so we cannot blame the model. <clears throat> that it's a bait. It just means the model isn't 100% accurate. So even when we process or uh, generate uh, the different models for our data sets, uh, we, uh, we get uh, not the 100% accuracy. We get 90%, 88%, sometimes if model is not good, then the race, but if model is good, we then get the 90 plus percentage, but not the 100 percentage. So therefore, if you are not getting the accuracy as a 100 percentage, you should not, uh, means not your accuracy is not 100 percentage. So you should not present the model that models are not working good. Models are working good, but there may be the outliers and other problems in the data set. So, <clears throat> if you uh, really wanted to try and uh, find a hypothesis that resulted in uh, minimizing the loss, you could come up uh, with a different decision boundary like here. So, so it wouldn't be a line, but uh, it would like uh, something like this phase. You see, this is not the uh, vertical or horizontal, right? But it is a different. Just uh, draw the uh, outlier that shows the not rainy days. So, <clears throat> uh, that we can definitely uh, show that uh, this uh, outlier, uh, this uh, uh, point is uh, different than this one. So, it wouldn't be uh, changeable. Uh, so, this decision boundary does separate all of the rate point means though it is not the straight or vertical line but definitely it uh, separate all of the rate points from all of the blue points there, there is a single rate point but there may be two or three even that there may be the blue point so it depends uh, outlier may be anywhere so <clears throat> uh, this decision boundary does uh, separate uh, this thing in a very good way uh, the rate point from all blue points because the uh, if you look here the rate point uh, fall on this side of this decision boundary the blue points fall on the other side of the uh, decision boundary uh, here or here uh, but uh, this we would probably all uh, is not as uh, good of the prediction even uh, though uh, it seems to be more accurate based on all of the available training data that we have for training this machine learning model so we uh, might say that it's probably not going to uh, generalize uh, well what if there were other data points like here and uh, there and there may be the more uh, uh, rate points and even the, there may be the view points. So we might just want to uh, consider those to be rainy days. For example, there is a one rate point, there may be another, but we might definitely we predict that it is a rainy days because we think this was probably just an outlier. So if the only thing you care about is uh, minimizing the loss on the data, <clears throat> if you see it's not a big loss, it's a single loss. So, if uh, you run the generate, uh, make the model or uh, analyze any data sets, you should try to get a, a little loss. Means you have to try minimize the uh, loss on the data you have available to you. 
and you run the risk of overfitting. And this can happen in the misclassification case. If you uh, make a model and process it, definitely you will get the true classified and misclassified. True class classification is a basically the real result means that your prediction is a true, but misclassification shows the error rate, means the loss. Loss of your uh, uh, loss of uh, the data, so it shows that how much your model is accurate. So it can also happen in the regression case uh, that here we predicted what we thought was a uh, what we predicted um, what we thought was a pretty good line relating advertising to sales and uh, trying to predict what sales were going to be for a given amount of advertising. So, <clears throat> uh, but I could uh, come up uh, with a line that does a better job of uh, predicting the training data and it would be uh, something that looks like uh, this just connecting all of the different data points and now there is a no loss at all. Now I have perfectly predicted given any uh, uh, advertising what uh, sales are and, uh, for all the data available to me it's uh, going to be accurate. If you find here there is no loss means it's a, there is a no misclassification there is a no loss but it's probably not going to generalize very well. I have overfit my model on the uh, training data that, and that is available to me. And so in general, and what is available to you, definitely you have to train the model according to your data. What type of data you have or on what type of the data you are working, definitely you will train according to that data. So, in general, we want to avoid overfitting. We would like uh, 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 strategies to make sure that we have overfit our model to a particular data set. And uh, there are a number of ways that you could try to do this. So, uh, selected data, downloaded data and perform such uh, these type of the operations we discussed before. Uh, oftentimes when you are doing a machine learning experiment when you have got uh, some data and you want to try and come up uh, with some function that uh, predicts given some input what the output is going to be. You don't uh, necessarily want to do your training on all of the data. So you have available to you. Because uh, what the data uh, or what the output is going to be, you don't necessarily want to do your data on all of the data you have available. Uh, means what data you have collected or downloaded, that is the your data and you have to make model on that data. <coughs> So, <clears throat> you don't necessarily, I think, you don't necessarily want to do your training on all of the data you have available to you. Means, for example, you, but you don't need to train the data with 100% of the data set. That you could employ a method known as a uh, holdout class validation. Means, for example, you have a data set you will find you should not train the model with 100% data but you should train the model with 60% of data or 40% of the data but 60% 40 to 60 percentage is a very good but if you are going uh, up then uh, the result may be uh, different and or uh, not real so uh, <clears throat> what will you do if you have data and you are training the data with the 40 percentage or 50 percentage, 60 percentage means that, uh, you could employ uh, then you may uh, employ a method known as a holdout cross validation. So where in a holdout cross validation we split up our data 
we split up our data into training set and testing set means you have 100 percentage of the data set now you will train the model with 60 percentage so 60 percentage will be the training data and the remaining the 40 percentage will be test data so you will test the model with the remaining data set so the training set is the set of the data that uh, we are going to use to train our machine learning model and the testing set is the set of data that we are going to use in order to test to see how well our machine learning model actually performed or how well our machine learning model is working so the learning happens on the training set how your training set is or how you train the model so we go, we figure out what the parameters should be so we figure out what the right model should be or what the right model is so and what we see all right now that we have trained the uh, trained the model see how uh, means we trained the model uh, see how uh, well it does uh, it predicting things and inside of the testing set so some set of data that we haven't seen before and the hope then is that we are going to be able to predict the testing set pretty well if uh, we are able to uh, generalize based on the training data that are available to us so if we have all fitted the training data though and uh, we are not able to generalize then uh, when we look at the testing set it is likely going to be the case that we are not going to predict things from the testing set nearly as effectively so this is one method of cross validation of uh, which are validating to make sure that the work we have done is actually going to generalize to uh, other data sets as well and uh, uh, there are other statistical techniques uh, we can use as well so one of the downsides of this just uh, hold out cross validation is if you say uh, i just split it 50 percentage training set and 50 percentage testing set or even you may um, if you are going up then 60 percent training and 40 percent testing but not more than 60 percentage so the minimum is the 40 percentage and minimum inside and upper is the 60 percentage so i train using the 50 percentage of the data and test using other the 50 percentage and sometimes i train the model with 60 percentage and use a 40 percentage for testing or you could even choose uh, other percentage as well so it depend on you but i suggest you don't go up then the 60 percentage and don't go down then the 40 percentage so if the 50 percentage is uh, i think uh, good but you may go from 50 percentage to 60 percentage means you may use the 50 percentage to 60 percentage of the data set for training so is it the uh, there's a fair amount of data if you are using such type of the data which i told you that even uh, i am uh, not using to train uh, more than the 60 percentage so i might be able to get a better uh, model as a result for example so one approach is known as a k-fold cross validation in k-fold cross validation rather than just divide things into two sets and run one experiment so one divide things into k different sets and maybe one divide things up into 10 different sets and then run 10 different examples so here the k the value of k will be 10 and i mostly use the value of k as a 10 <coughs> when i use the cross validation so i select the value of k almost 10 so if i split up my data into 10 different sets of data then what i will do is uh, each time for each of my 10 experiments i will hold out uh, one of uh, those sets of data where i will say uh, let me train my model on uh, these nine sets and then test to see how uh, well it predicts on set number 10 and then pick another set of nine sets to train on and then test it on uh, the other one that I held out. So, very time uh, I train the model on every 
uh, thing minus the one set that I am holding out and then uh, test to see how uh, well our model performs on the test and that I did hold out. So what you end up with getting is a 10 different results, the 10 different answers for uh, how accurately our model worked. And oftentimes you can just uh, take the average of uh, those 10 to uh, get an uh, approximation for how well we think our model perform so overall. But the key idea is uh, separating the training data from the testing data because you want to test your model on data and that is different from what you trained the model on. Because the training you want to avoid uh, overfitting, you want to be able to generalize. And uh, the way you test uh, whether you are able to generalize and is by looking at some data that you, have, you haven't seen before and seeing how well uh, we are actually able to perform. So, uh, if we want to actually implement any of these techniques inside of a, a programming language like Python, a number of ways we could do that. So, we could even write this from scratch on our own. But uh, there are libraries out there that allow us to take advantage of existing implementation of uh, these algorithms so that we can use the same types of algorithms in a lot of uh, different uh, situations and so there is a library uh, very popular but known as a scikit-learn so which allows us in a python to be able to very quickly get set up with a lot of these uh, different machine learning models <coughs> So scikit learn is uh, probably the most useful library for machine learning in a Python. I, I mostly use the Python, the Jupyter, uh, Jupyter notebook, and I use the uh, scikit learn for the different data analysis processes. Uh, the uh, uh, SQL learn library contains a lot of uh, efficient tools for machine learning and uh, statistical mod uh, modeling including the classification, regression, clustering and, uh, and dimensionality prediction. So scikit-learn comes loaded with a lot of uh, features. Here are a few of them to help you understand the spread like the supervised learning algorithm. Uh, the cross validation and super learning algorithm. The supervised learning algorithms, think of any supervised machine learning <coughs> algorithm. It's not only with the SVM, not only with the KNN, but NABIS or other anyone you might have heard about, and there is a very uh, high chance that <coughs> it is a part of uh, scikit learn. So, starting from uh, generalized linear models, uh, for example, linear regression, support vector machines, uh, decision trees, to uh, Bayesian methods, all of uh, them are part of the scikit toolbox, and these all are the supervised learning methods. The speed of machine learning algorithm is uh, one of the big reasons for the high usage of scikit uh, recommended. Uh, uh, even you may uh, start scikit to uh, solve uh, supervised learning problems and you may uh, work on any uh, machine learning uh, <coughs> algorithm and uh, would recommend uh, that to people new to scikit machine learning as well. So if you are working on the Python, you must use the scikit to uh, process the data. And the cross validation, as uh, I discussed already, scikit support the cross validation models. Um, there are various methods to check the accuracy of supervised models on unseen data using SQL. So the one, uh, one we discussed here, the cross one, Validation with the K values and the unsupervised learning algorithm. Uh, also, uh, there is a large uh, spread of machine learning algorithms in the offering, starting from the clustering, factor analysis, uh, principal component analysis to unsupervised uh, neural network. So, if you are willing to work, you may use the uh, scikit learn uh, on the Python and you may perform different type of the perform. Uh, <coughs> models and even the make different type of the models on this and use you may use a different uh, uh, machine learning classifiers. 
Uh, so we try and solve those problems using several different methods and of trying to uh, take data and run patterns in that data whether that is trying to find neighboring data points uh, that are similar or trying to minimize some sort of uh, loss functions uh, like the I0 to 1, L1, L2 and where any number of other techniques that allow us to begin to try to solve these sorts of problems. So that then we was um, look at some uh, of the principles that are at the foundations of modern machine learning. So this ability to take data and learn from the data so that the computer can perform a task even if they haven't explicitly been given instruction to do so. So dear students, next time we will continue this conversation about machine learning and hopefully on the unsupervised learning. So see you again. Thank you for watching this well. Uh, lecture hope uh, you learn a lot and uh, watch it uh, carefully again and again and make the notes to understand the future uh, lectures take care a lot of